Dr. Gagnon wrote, it may sound in 9, 1 through 29 like everything is predetermined, giving no option for human beings to resist or respond. Yet even the potter clay imagery echoes the potter story in Jeremiah 18, in which God emphasizes that the fate of nations is determined by their response to God. And if they change that response, God will change the good or evil he planned for them. So God has plans, but these plans interact with human will. And as I read stuff like this, where instead of going into Romans 9, where it specifically says, not human will, <laughs> it, just, it, it says it as strongly and as repetitively as possible. This is how Norman Geisler would uh, approached it. Well, you know, we, we can't get focused on just Romans 9. Uh, think about the potter and the clay, and let's go over to, to, to Jeremiah 18. But that wasn't what Paul applied. He didn't apply it to nations. He didn't do the Jeremiah 18 thing. He did, God prepares vessels unto destruction, and God prepares vessels of mercy. That was his application. And, and so I, I'm just looking at this, and, and it was just like the John 6 thing. Instead of actually following the train of thought from 636, 635, all the way through, which we've done over and over and over again, and I did again in the article, instead it's, yeah, but over here in John 15 it says this, but John 6 was written before John 15. You can't go to John 15 and say John 15 contains absolutely necessary information. It must be read back. Because what you're saying is John wrote his gospel to be read backwards. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. I'm not saying that, there's, that there, there are not, and I've said this many, many times, there are beautiful threads and themes that are woven throughout the gospel of John. But that doesn't mean you can read it backwards. And he did the same thing that, that Geisler did by going to John 640 and reading that backwards into John 639, rather than following the flow of thought and allowing definitions to be provided by the writer himself. This is your standard, synergistic, man-centered, Wesleyan approach that results in, and the thing is, it results in exegesis that is not the exegesis we have found in 1 Corinthians 6, or in 1 Timothy 1, you know, because you go to 1 Timothy 1 and, hey, look, here's all the evidence that Paul is using the Decalogue here. And so Arsen Akoites, here in the Decalogue, going with Pornia, I mean, so he's done that kind of solid, you start here, you walk through, because he's dealing with New Testament scholars that aren't doing that and they're misrepresenting the text. So he's like, no, 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 here's how you do it. But it just doesn't, I, I don't, from what I've read so far, and it's just Facebook stuff, but this isn't his area that he's written in, so I don't have anything else to go on. And with all due respect, it just doesn't seem to me like he's read the Institutes or read the Westminster Confession or understood what it was saying when it said God sovereignly decrees all whatsoever comes to pass. And so the number of the elect is fixed and all that old time Calvinism stuff. You would think there would be some interaction with that or some recognition of that, or at least some rejection of it outside of just ignoring it. it Cause it's ignored here. There's no Romans nine is just simply yeah, don't worry about the fact that Romans 9 specifically says it does not have to do with the will of man. And yet the conclusion is, so God has plans, but these plans interact with human will. That's not what Romans 9 says. That's the exact opposite of what Romans 9 says. Um, so, I mean, it's just, it's confusing. It really is confusing. But today... There was stuff on Philippians chapter two, and I, it 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 was it was concerning, um, and I think it's concerning to a lot of folks, not just me. So that's why I'm talking about. So you know that right after the Carmen Christi, right after that incredible sermon example, of verses five through eleven, don't look to the things of yourself, but look to the things of others. Humility of mind, key issue. Paul gets back to his exhortation. And he says, therefore, so then, 
my beloved ones, just as you have always obeyed, <clears throat> not just uh, in my presence only, but much more in my absence, metafabu kaitramu tain heauton soterian kater gadzeste. Theosgar esten ha energon en humin kaita thelain kaita energain hu pertes eudakias. So then, my beloved, just as you have heard, just as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but in my absence. Heauton soterion, your salvation. Now it's plural. So he's talking about the church as a whole, because that's what the exhortation has been to. This is how you have peace in the church, humility of mind toward one another. Okay? Then he says, kater gadzeste, work out, and he put a whole section of saying, it's not really work out, um, it's, how do you put it, work for? Well, I might have it right here. Um, Paul, quote, Paul is really telling his readers at Philippi to work at, bring about, affect, or gain by work, accomplish their own salvation. The fact that Paul exhorts his readers to be doing this with fear and trembling supports this normal translation. Paul adds this to impress upon believers the gravity of the situation and the dire consequences that would follow from not working out your own salvation, namely not being raised from the dead in transformed bodies and consequently loss of eternal life in the kingdom of God. Is that what Paul is saying here? Not even close. Not even close. Paul's not addressing that at all. He's talking to the congregation, and he's warning them against division. And he's referring to them in the plural. And he's telling them, God is the one working amongst you. That's why it's meta fabu kai tramu. Not because you're going to not earn your salvation, not work out your salvation. But because it is God, the one working in you, and who mean, plural, both to will and to work, who per tes eudakias, according to his kind intention. Now we could jump over to Ephesians 1 and talk about eudakia and the ground of God's choosing and eternal salvation, everything else there. But then notice the next phrase is panta poiaita koris gongusmon kai dialogismon. Do all things without gungus mooing. Remember my one of my favorite Greek terms, gungus mooing. Grumbling, also in John 6. And disputing. It's literally dialoguing, but it's being put in a negative, so you go with that part of the semantic domain. Anyways, so again, this is life in the church. This is life in the fellowship. And so this working out of salvation is living in communion with one another by practicing humility of mind as Jesus demonstrated and that's what the Carmen Christi was all about. So, but the, the point, the, the reason for fear and trembling is because you recognize that it is God who is at work within you. Within you, the people. That's what Philippians 2 is about. And so it, I think, is worthwhile to point out that when Paul is really telling his readers at Philippi to work at, bring about, effect, or gain by work, accomplish their own salvation. No. It seems that what Dr. Gagnon is saying is salvation is provided by grace alone but it is accomplished and obtained through our works. Which is really what you're stuck with in provisionism too, which, again, all synergistic systems end up coming down to that. Um, so, it's troubling to see that because we've often said we 
we rejoice in the blessed inconsistencies of our Armenian brothers. But it doesn't look like the, cons the inconsistency is here. There is a consistent, um, I think, very dangerous missing of the centrality of grace and the power of grace and the actual purpose of salvation, which is not focused upon us. It's focused upon the Father, Son, Holy Spirit accomplishing what has been decreed from eternity past. Now, I said it just not, did not seem that there is really a familiarity with past Presbyterian writers and Reformed theology and things like that. You tell me. He wrote an article, I think this morning, on the tulip. And I, I read the whole thing, and I'm trying to, I'm reading, as a friendly person, I don't want to be at odds with Bob Gagnon, but this is important stuff. This is, this is the essence of the gospel that we then communicate to people. And it just struck me that this is not a person who has ever, who certainly has ever held to Reformed theology with an understanding of, of, of its consistency and its wholeness. But it doesn't even seem like it's done much reading in that area at all. You, you tell me. Here's, here's, the, here's L. Here's limited atonement. You, you tell me. Regarding limited atonement, I don't think God works toward, works toward limiting atonement, but rather toward maximizing it. That said... Atonement is certainly limited because not everyone will be saved. And the only confident way of being saved is by believing in Jesus, faith understood in a holistic sense that leads to a transformed life. Still, some people seem to be attended to by God and his emissaries more than others. It is a complex issue, and I'm not sure how to resolve everything, except to say that our cue from God is to take the gospel to as many as possible and to be as little of a stumbling block as possible to the reception of the gospel without, of course, compromising truth and love. That is what God wants to be our operating premise, which is good enough for me. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm literally wanting to read, still some people seem to be attended to by God and his emissaries more than others as some kind of an affirmation of election. You know, you know I, I'm really wanting to read this positively. But limited atonement is simply the recognition of the consistency of the Father and the Son in accomplishing the one purpose of God so that the Son dies to redeem those that the Father has chosen to redeem. It has to do with substitution. It has to do with who is going to be united with Christ. It has to do with what the very source of having saving faith is. I've seen nothing so far in any of this that would indicate that Dr. Gagnon has any acceptance of the idea that saving faith is a gift from God. That, that Philippians 1.29 says it has been granted to us not only to suffer for, to believe and to suffer for his, his name. It's been granted to us to believe. I, I've seen none of that. And so I'm just, I, I, if someone described limited atonement in this way, my, and if, if you hadn't told me who it was and you just gave this to me and said, just, just for larks, what do you think this background, the guy's background be? I would never, ever, ever say a theology professor at a Presbyterian seminary. Maybe the PCUSA has been so far removed from anything close to historically reformed for so long that, that I was naive to make that connection. I, I suppose that's possible. Um, I do try to Think the best, and but this description of limited atonement actually doesn't touch on why anyone would believe in it, why I believe in it, why I think it is biblical, why I think it's right there what you what you find in Romans chapter eight. Um. Anyway, um. 
Okay, and then here's another one. Oops, done past time. Give me a few more minutes. One could argue that unconditional election is not the same as unconditional salvation, but this seems to me to be a distinction without much of a difference. There is no election of someone who won't believe or no maintenance of election in individuals who do not continue in faith. That is a doctrine of election that is completely man-centered. This isn't, election is a divine act. It's God's choice. He chose us in eternity past. So you don't maintain that. Your saving faith is the result of that. It's God working within you, both to will and do according to his good pleasure, as we just saw. So, so election too is bound up with the condition of faith. So you're only elect if you believe. So God, election is not God's choice. It's ours. I, I, don't, I don't know how else to read this. The Father requires those whom he elects to believe in his Son. How about the Father chooses his elect, draws them unto the Son, and as a result of the Spirit's work in their life, they believe and continue to do so and have persevering faith. That would fit John 6, wouldn't it? No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up in the last day. And there is no distinction between the two autons. We've covered that. Salvation is also contingent upon maintenance of a transformed life, according to numerous New Testament texts. This is what we deal with Roman Catholicism on all the time, because that's what they say. Instead of God's work of justifying and changing the heart so that the result is good works that flow from that changed heart, salvation is contingent upon maintenance of a transformed life, according to numerous New Testament texts. So this is the difference between prescription and description. And Dr. Gagnon is saying this is prescriptive, just as Rome says, just as Wesley said rather than this is descriptive of what the Holy Spirit accomplishes in the lives of his redeemed people to his honor and glory. This is the divide of the Reformation. Dr. Gagnon's on the other side. These words are on the other side. I'm not trying to start a war here. I'm just pointing out. I've taught church history for as long as Dr. Gagnon's been teaching, and this is on the other side of that divide. This is on the other side of the Tiber. Um... That's incredibly, incredibly troubling stuff. But again, it's troubling because it seems so inconsistent to me, not only with the history, but then inconsistent with the excellent examples of exegesis that have been provided to us in another area, which again, I was thinking about and I'm like, well, I, I get that part. Because the reality is there is no part of Christian revelation that more directly strikes at man's autonomy than this. And so how many people do we know who are so good in this area and so good in that area? It comes this one area and all of a sudden they use a different exegetical methodology. And that's what we've got here too. So, I just got the feeling, and there's so much more, I've, I've got a ton of stuff here, but it, it just struck me, because, real quick, and I quoted it in the, uh, in the thing, um, he, I quoted the, the reason why he was doing this, and, and I agree with him on this, we're, we're, we're in absolute agreement about this, and that is, what he really finds objectionable 
Here, if you believe that the new covenant makes it possible, albeit not preferable, to live a sin-controlled life without fear of not inheriting God's kingdom, consider yourself a purveyor of the heresy of antinomianism. Now, he recognizes that perseverance of the saints is not once saved, always saved. He recognizes that difference. I'm just not sure if he recognizes why that difference exists. It's not just a different way of putting it. The perseverance of the saints comes about because the Son will always do the will of the Father. That's its origin and source. I don't see a recognition of that. But we both recognize the anti-lordship, easy believism, get your ticket punch stuff is reprehensibly false. And obviously so. So we get that. It just seems to me this is, as you said, it's this is your sort of standard Wesleyan holiness stuff that Whitfield and and uh, and Wesley went at about a long time ago and comes up all the time. But it has to come up all the time because this is this is a difference. This you know Spurgeon wrote a great book, All of Grace, still needs to be read. Important stuff, really important stuff.